be in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Going to begin reading in verse 10. Let's talk about partnership in giving and receiving. Philippians 4.10. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, but I desire that more compound interest may be accrued to your heavenly account. That's literally what the Greek says there, and we'll talk about that. I have received full payment and have, and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. In 1999, when we were gearing up to build this building, I had lunch with a wonderful, experienced pastor. We were talking about gathering the funds to build this building, and he planted two seeds in my heart that day that I've never forgotten. The first was a seed of correction. Being that we live in such a unique community of wealthy people, many of us, myself included, had this idea that God was just going to move on the heart of some multimillionaire to write a check that would cover our whole project. I hadn't voiced that to my friend, but the Holy Spirit prompted him to give me this word. He said, Glenn... Whatever God is going to do at harvest time, he is going to do through the people of harvest time. God wants you all to grow in your faith. He wants you to all learn sowing and reaping. He wants to perform miracles in your lives. I want to tell you that that was a painful but a very necessary attitude adjustment. Truthfully, our attitude was irresponsible. Let someone else do it. When God was saying, no, I called you to do it, and I'm with you. And sure enough, as we began sowing, God did absolutely tremendous financial miracles for people. There were people who brought me checks in the amount of $30,000, $50,000 to build this building that would have never believed they could give that much. Many people received bonuses out of the blue in the exact amount of the pledge that they had made to help build this building. Several people received inheritances in the exact amount of their pledge. That happened to my wife and I. And our faith grew. The second seed was a seed of encouragement. He said to me, Glenn, whenever you ask people to give sacrificially to build, there will always be some people who refuse to participate for some reason. He said, don't worry about them. Just leave them to God. And then he pointed out something from the book of Nehemiah that I never noticed before. In Nehemiah chapter 3, there were some people who refused to participate in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Among them were the princes of a suburb called Tekoa. But the townspeople of Tekoa rallied together and they completed their section of wall without their leaders. And then the men of Tekoa went on and they completed a second section of the wall. So starting from a deficit, they did twice as much as anybody else. This is the seed of encouragement he planted in my heart. He said, Glenn, there will always be some people that refuse to participate for whatever reason, but God will give you men and women of Tekoa. 
He will give you people who will not only do their part, but they will pick up the slack left by others. I have to say that I have found his words so true. Jump In is the sixth capital campaign that we've done in 18 years. In every campaign, including this one, we've had people who refused to make pledges and we've had people who didn't fulfill their pledges. But in every campaign, we've given more than our pledge total because of men and women of Tokoa who not only did their part, but kept going and gave more. The Philippians were precisely those kind of people. The Philippians were men and women of Tokoa. When others did little or nothing, they were the people who did more. And they didn't just do it once, they kept doing it again and again. In the early days of Paul's ministry, they were the first church to begin sending missionary support to Paul while he was on the field. Although they themselves were suffering economic persecution because of their faith in Christ, they sent support to Paul while he was preaching in Thessalonica. Paul had planted dozens of other churches in Syria and Turkey. Those churches were well established. The Philippians were the newest church. They were little baby Christians, but they were the first ones to send money to the field. Paul went on to wealthy Corinth and they sent Paul support there. Can you imagine that that would be something like the believers in Houston getting together as they're struggling to recover and sending us an offering here in Greenwich to build a building? When Paul was preparing to leave Corinth to carry an offering to Jerusalem, the Philippians begged Paul to allow them to contribute. They were suffering so much for Jesus that Paul planned not to burden them by asking them to give. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 that the Philippians pleaded with him for the privilege of giving. Some believers get offended when there's an offering. But the Philippians considered it a privilege and they begged not to be left out. For almost three years, Paul was inaccessible. He was in Roman custody in Israel and then he was on a prison transport ship. But as soon as the Philippians found out that he was settled in Rome, at the very first opportunity, they sent an offering. Beloved, can I tell you, when I think about the Philippians, I think that that's exactly what harvest time is like. And that's what I want us to continue to be like, even more and more. I want us to be men and women of Tekoa. When others refuse, I want us to be the ones who give double. I want us to be the first to give. I don't want us to hold back because someone else has more than we do or someone else ha has fewer challenges than we do. When others get offended by an offering, I want us to consider it a privilege to participate. When there's a need, I want us to beg to give towards it. My prayer is that God would make harvest time, like the Philippian church, a place with giving hearts. As I look at Paul's final words in Philippians, I see five truths about partnership and giving and receiving. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Five truths about giving and receiving. First of all, your giving is a special partnership in the gospel. Your giving is a special partnership in the gospel. In Philippians, Paul writes the strangest thank you note ever. The occasion for this whole little letter is to say thank you. You see, in Rome, meals and medicine and anything you might need was not included with your prison stay. When you checked into the Roman prison, they did not give you a coupon for the complimentary breakfast buffet. If your family and friends did not send support from the outside, you would starve to death. So the Philippians' gift to Paul was critical. But here in Philippians 4, his thank you almost reads like a thanks but no thanks note. He says, I burst into praise when I received your gift, but I would have been fine with or without it. Nevertheless, it was good of you to send it. Why does Paul write that way? Well, what kind of thanks is that? Imagine if I sent you a thank you note. Thank you for buying 10 chairs for phase two. But we would have been fine with or without your gift. 
nevertheless, it was good of you. It's not that Paul was ungrateful. It's not that their gift wasn't a much needed, timely blessing. It's that Paul wants to teach his Philippian sheep spiritual principles far more than the good that their gift did for Paul. Paul is excited about the good that their giving did for them. He says, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is the compound interest that will accrue to your heavenly account. Maybe you've heard of a parent saying to a child, this spanking is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. And the child says, yeah, right. What Paul is saying in Philippians 4 is, this gift is going to bless you even more than it has blessed me. And it's true. Beloved, I want you to know that your giving to God blesses you even more than those you've given to. Your giving to phase two blesses you more even than it'll bless phase two. Paul said that is a promise you can take to the bank. Beloved, it's important that we understand this morning that giving to the church, giving to the gospel, giving to missions is unlike any other kind of giving on earth. Giving to the gospel is different than compassion giving or benevolent charitable giving. It's different than philanthropy. It's different than patronage of the humanities or the arts. It's different than supporting good causes. All of those things are noble and, and worthy and good, but giving to the gospel is something different altogether. Giving to the gospel is spiritual. It's a spiritual act with spiritual consequences. Paul uses the language of banking here in Philippians 4 to, to tell us that it is a spiritual transaction with spiritual returns. Giving to the gospel is different because giving to the gospel is to enter into a special friendship partnership with God. One of my absolute heroes in life is my father-in-law. He's here with us this morning. Dad grew up on a farm in Alberta, Canada in the 30s and 40s. One of, my, one of the many things that I admire about that is he can fix just about anything. You see, if something broke on the farm, you had to fix it. You had no choice. As a young man, Dad moved to Toronto and someone gave him a broken down old printing press. Dad fixed it up and he got it running again and he started a printing company with his cousin Stan. And the Lord abundantly blessed their special friendship partnership. When I met Denise in 1994, the company had grown to a massive operation of printing presses that ran 24 hours a day, six days a week. But for almost 60 years, Dad and Uncle Stan have worked together in perfect harmony as brothers and best friends and business partners. My mother-in-law used to joke that they're practically married to each other. There's seldom a day that goes by that they don't talk. And when they sold the printing company, they launched a ministry together and they've done amazing things for the Lord in Ukraine. That's dad there in the center of that photo. Uncle Stan is on the far right. And that's, we're standing in a seminary that they built in Ukraine along with a church that holds 3,000 people. It's gorgeous. I said to dad and uncle, we have some Ukrainians here. Why couldn't you build that right here in Greenwich? And maybe dad and uncle Stan's partnership is a good picture of the word koinonia, the word fellowship in Philippians. Paul says that by their giving, the Philippians have become friendship partners of the gospel. Just like dad and uncle Stan, the Philippians have become brothers, best friends, business partners in the gospel. Philippians 1.3, I thank my God every time I remember you because of your koinonia, because of your fellowship partnership in the gospel. Philippians 4.16, as you yourselves know, in the early days, not one church shared, not one church koinonia, not one church friendship partnership partnered with me except you only when we give to the gospel we enter into a special friendship partnership with each other but especially with God beloved listen to me please hear my heart this morning 
Thanksgiving is not just thoughtlessly dropping 20 bucks in the plate each week. If you didn't think about what you were going to give this morning before you came to the house of God, you probably didn't give enough. Giving is friendship with God. It deepens our personal relationship with him. It ushers us into a working relationship with God that is guaranteed to be a productive, profitable partnership. What if Warren Buffett called you today and he said, I have an offer for you. I want you to become my exclusive business partner. I'm going to bring all the capital to the table. I'm going to bring all my business experience, all my investing experience. I'm going to bring all my contacts. The only thing you have to do is agree to split your share of the profit 90-10. You keep 90 and you give 10 back to the partnership. Who would take a deal like that from Warren Buffett? I would take that deal. Can I tell you that's precisely... What God has offered to us in giving to the gospel, we enter into a koinonia, a special friendship, partnership with him. And that's good preaching. Partnership in giving. Five truths from Philippians 4. Your giving is partnership in the gospel. Number two, your giving is one way to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. I have to say that I've absolutely fallen in love with the book of Philippians. Up until uh, this summer, Galatians has been my favorite letter of Paul so far. But now I, I've lost my, uh, my first love. And now I'm in love with this beautiful little letter of Philippians. Some of the most powerful, passionate passages in the whole New Testament. But whatever things I once considered credits... I now consider debits for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a debit compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things that I might gain Christ. Beloved, listen to me. Paul not only regarded his material possessions as unimportant, he actually divested himself. It's one thing to say, this doesn't mean very much to me. It's quite another thing to let it go. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. To know Christ in the power of his resurrection means to be born again. It means by faith I have experienced an inner resurrection of my spirit man that was dead in trespasses and sins. I was dead and now I'm alive and I walk in newness of life. I'm excited right there. (laughs) To know Christ in the fellowship of his suffering means that I live the crucified life like Jesus did. It means that I live in complete humility and submission and obedience to the Father. And one way, one way that's expressed is through our giving. Giving is a sacrifice. It costs me something. It requires me to deny myself and take up my cross and die to self. It might require me to defer something that I want to do or give something up. Or do with a little less. Giving is an act of obedience and submission. Paul says in 418, Philippians 4.18 that our giving is a fragrant offering. You know, he uses those same words of Jesus' offering of himself on the cross in Ephesians 5.2. So when we give, we're making a fragrant offering just like Jesus made a fragrant offering of himself on the cross. So when we give, we're entering into the fellowship of his suffering. In Philippians 1.29, Paul says it has been granted to us not only to believe on Christ, but to suffer for him. One of the ways that we do that is through our sacrificial participation in the gospel. Starting Sunday school today, I'm so proud of our Sunday school teachers. Listen, if your kids attend Sunday school, would you, would you hug a Sunday school teacher at the, end of, at the end of service today? Our Sunday school teachers serve every week during the school year. That's an amazing commitment. That's participating with Christ. 
in the fellowship of his sufferings. When we offer our time, we're entering into the fellowship of, our, of his sufferings. When we offer our talents free of charge, we're entering into the fellowship of his sufferings. When we offer him our hard-earned dollars, we're entering into the fellowship of his suffering. Partnership and giving. Five truths from Philippians 4. Your giving is partnership in the gospel. It's a way to know Christ and the fellowship of his suffering. Number three, here's my favorite. Your giving is a heavenly investment. Beloved, giving to the church, giving to the gospel is unlike any other kind of giving on earth. Paul uses the language of banking to tell us so. He says, your giving has done even more good for you than it has for me. He said, I don't desire your gifts. What I desire is that compound interest may accumulate in your heavenly account. Beloved, I want to tell you, please be encouraged this morning. Every gift you have ever offered to the Lord, every tithe you've given, every missions offering, every building offering, every benevolence offering, every love offering you've given to blessed minister, it has gone into an account in heaven with your name on it. And while you're living out your days for Christ here on earth, that account is accruing compound interest. That's the words in Greek. I wonder what the interest is in heaven. 20%? No, the economy of heaven is always expanding. It never contracts. There is always a bull market in heaven. There are no market corrections in heaven. There's only growth. Actually, Jesus said in Matthew 13, the low end is 3,000% interest. The mid range is 6,000% interest. The top range is 10,000% interest. Jesus taught the same thing about giving. He said that by our giving here on earth, we are storing up treasure for ourselves in heaven with our name on it. Have you ever thought about this for a second? What on earth would we do with treasure in heaven? What need will we have for treasure in a place where the streets are made of gold? What need will we have for treasure in a place where the foundation of the city is layers upon layers of precious stones? You know what job I want in heaven? I want to be a ditch digger in heaven. Oh, we're digging through the diamond layer today and then the emerald layer and then the sapphire layer and then the aquamarine and the onyx and the topaz layer. If this was only a heaven, your wife would be so happy to see you come home with your clothes covered in dirt. Honey, look, we made a fortune today. What need will we have for treasure in a place where God himself has prepared a mansion for us? There will be no mortgage payment in heaven. There will be no rent, no taxes, no homeowner's insurance, no flood insurance. There will be no maintenance in heaven. What need will we have for treasure in a place lit by the radiance of God himself? There will be no heat bill. There will be no light bill in heaven. What need will we have for treasure in a place where God himself will serve us food at his banqueting table and where the trees bear fruit 12 months out of the year? Good news, Amazon has lowered prices at Whole Foods, but better news, there'll be no grocery bill in heaven. What need will we have for treasure in a place where we live in glorified bodies clothed in splendor that never get injured or grow old or sick? There'll be no clothes shopping in heaven. There'll be no hair and nail salons. There'll be no gym memberships. There'll be no insurance premiums. There'll be no medical co-pays. Thank you, Jesus, in heaven. There are no expenses in heaven. There are no social classes. Oh, won't that be heaven? There's no one to impress in heaven. There are no Joneses to keep up with. Everyone is a Jones in heaven. So what will we do with all this treasure? Well, the Bible says we'll use it to heap more and more honor on Jesus. We'll lay our treasure at his nail-scarred feet and we'll say, this is all in honor of you, Jesus. I laid up this treasure by my sacrifices on earth because you are worthy of it all. You are worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
And don't you want a worthy treasure to lay at his feet on that day? Don't you want to present a gift of beauty and value that expresses the depth of your love for him on your 25th wedding anniversary? Would you give your love a crackerjack ring? On your 50th anniversary, would you give her a crackerjack ring to say thank you for a life of passion and devotion? Don't be embarrassed at his throne because all you have to bestow on him is a Cracker Jack ring. You ever shown up at a party with a gift that wasn't adequate for the occasion? (laughs) Shortly after Denise and I moved here in 1996, we attended our first Italian wedding. (laughs) And we showed up at the wedding reception with a wrapped gift. What did we know? I'm a German-Irish mutt from Philly. Denise is a Ukrainian from Toronto. And nobody, nobody, Chicky, Gloria, Faithy, nobody could do us the courtesy to tell us that you do not show up at an Italian wedding with a wrapped gift. You show up with an envelope. I don't remember what we bought. It was something nice from the registry. It was big. It was in a big box. And there I am walking through the banquet room looking for the gift table and there's no gift table. I'm looking for the pile. Where are all the presents? There are no presents. I also learned my first Italian word that night. Scumbari. See, that's what we were. Scumbari standing at the wedding reception with our wrapped wedding present. Beloved, listen to me. I don't want you to be scumbari at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't want to bump into you red-faced at the reception because you lived a self-indulgent life on earth and you didn't lay up any treasure on heaven to give to Jesus. You had the house. You had all the toys, you had the cars, the motorcycles, you had the boats, you had the vacations, you dropped more on bottles of wine at dinner than you dropped in the offering plate. You're going to show up at the marriage supper of the Lamb with a Cracker Jack ring. (laughs) Meanwhile, can I tell you that some of our beloved, precious Filipino brothers and sisters who work multiple jobs have given many thousands of dollars to phase two. No wonder Jesus said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. When I first started ministry, I had the privilege of meeting Dan Betzer. He pastors a huge church in Naples, Florida. We need to pray for them. They give millions of dollars every year to missions. And Dan Betzer said, I was just starting out in ministry. He said this to me. He said, Glenn, he said, when your people get to heaven, they will thank you for every opportunity you ever gave them to give to the kingdom of God. And it's true. When you get to heaven, you're going to say, I am so glad that I was part of harvest time when they bought that land, when they built phase one, when they put up the air dome, when they built phase two, when they built phase three. I don't know what that is yet, but we'll come up with one. I'm so glad Pastor Glenn made me buy those seats. Look at all this treasure in heaven I have to heap on Jesus. We talked about inner vows last week. And I can't help wondering in my spirit if maybe there's someone who hasn't made an inner vow with regard to phase two. I gave to the land. I gave to phase one. I gave to the dome. I gave to the first campaign to build phase two. I've done my part. I'm not doing anymore. I beg you, I beg you. Not to take that attitude. Aren't you so glad our Heavenly Father doesn't take that attitude? What? I gave you daily bread yesterday. (laughs) For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Five truths from Philippians 4. Number three, your giving is fragrant worship that pleases God. Beloved, giving to the church, giving to the gospel is unlike any other kind of giving on earth. It is a spiritual act of worship. 
It smells good to God. But what smells to him is not the smell of money. What smells good to him is your heart in worship. Your giving is an indication of your spiritual health. Jesus said that our giving or our lack of giving reveals what we really treasure in our heart. Whether we treasure ourselves or whether we treasure him, it, it indicates our focus. Is it on earthly things or it is on things above? The reason Paul was so overjoyed by the Philippians' gift was not so much the help it brought him, although it was definitely a big and necessary help. Paul said, because of your giving, I'm fully supplied and overflowing. I can't wait to stand up here one Sunday very soon and say, I have good news because of your giving. Phase two is fully finished. It's fully furnished. It's fully outfitted. It's fully functional. There's no need left. Their gift fully supplied Paul, but that's not why Paul rejoiced. Paul rejoiced because their giving was a sure sign to him that God was indeed carrying on the good work he began in them. Their giving was a sign to Paul that they were still walking with Jesus, that 10 years later they were still on track, that, it, that they were still passionately pursuing Jesus. Beloved, if I can ask you a very pointed question. What does your giving right now say about you? I'm not talking about what you've given in the past. I'm talking about right now. What does your giving say about the condition of your heart? What does it say about your focus right now? Partnership in giving, five truths from Philippians 4. Your giving is partnership in the gospel. It's a way to know Christ in the fellowship of suffering. It's a heavenly investment. It's fragrant worship. Finally, this. Oh, this is my favorite part too. I thought three was my favorite part, but this one's really my favorite part. Your giving brings a proportionate, disproportionate response from heaven. <laughs> giving to the church, giving to the gospel is different than any other kind of giving on earth. It brings a response of heaven's provision. See, the blessings of the Lord for giving are not for heaven only. There's an immediate reward from the Lord here on earth as well. Let me share two things and we're done quickly. Your generosity brings a proportionate response from heaven. God responds to your generosity with his generosity. Jesus taught a principle that's reinforced all over scripture. God blesses us with provision in proportion to how generously we give to him. One day Jesus sat across from the temple treasury watching people giving their offerings. Mark actually writes Jesus sat against the treasury. It means he sat as a judge in judgment. He was weighing people's offerings. Jesus watched people depositing various amounts until along came a widow who put in two tiny copper coins worth a fraction of a penny. Actually, I have two of those coins in my office. Someone gave them to me, a coin collector. They're about the size of a shirt button. They're so tiny. And when she put in those two tiny coins, Jesus said, there, that's what I've been looking for. He called the disciples and he said, all these others, they gave a bit out of their wealth, but she out of her need gave all that she had. Beloved, can I tell you, God weighs our giving. I don't know what anybody gives to this church. I don't know what any of you have given. When we were building this building, a handful of people brought me checks. Nobody has, people have given, they've given tremendous amounts. Nobody's done that. Those are the only gifts in 21 years that I've been here. Those are the only gifts that I know who's given what. Otherwise, I do not know. But God weighs your giving. And he's looking not at the dollar amount per se, but whether you've given generously to him in proportion to how much he's given you. Jesus taught this. He said, give and it shall be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will cause men to pour into your lap. Listen, this is the words of Jesus, Yeshua, our master, our savior. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 
Paul taught this as well, actually holding up the beloved Philippians as an example. He writes to the Corinthians, remember this, whoever sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously shall reap generously. It all boils down to this. Do you want the blessing of God on your finances or would you rather just go it your own? Do you want God to bless your career? Do you want God to bless your business? Do you want God to bless your assets? Do you want him to protect your property? Do you want him to bless you in buying and selling? Do you want him to bless your retirement? Do you want him to bless your kid's future? Do you know how many young adults I've seen who have made buckets of money and it's because their parents were givers and God blessed their children with the ability to get wealth? Do you want the blessing of God? Then be generous with God. But if you'd rather go it on your own, be stingy. It's your choice. But take it from a guy who's building a $24 million building for $13 million in one of the most expensive markets in the world. You might want to go with God. We had another miracle this week. In order to satisfy the zoning regulations, we have to raise the grade outside of this building. On the south side of this building, we have to bring the ground up. We have to lose a window in one of the classrooms downstairs. We have to build big retaining walls and fill them up with dirt. That's why, if you're wondering why that huge dirt pile is still there out front, that's why it's waiting to get moved over to that side of the building. And it's expensive, it's a lot of money. I I went to the town two weeks ago and I said to them, is there any way that we can get out of doing this work? Is there any way that, that we can get this waived? And they said, absolutely not. And I said, okay, Lord, you know. And then Larry DeLuca, our site contractor, came to me this week. And he said, you know, I'm doing another job in town. And I have a bunch of huge boulders that I have to get rid of. He said, rather than building reinforced cement walls, he said, I can build those walls out of boulders. And he said, I'll bring you the boulders for free. And I'll build the wall for you for free. And Larry went to town hall and he got the change approved for us, something we could not do on our own. There's a little more to the story that I'm not at liberty to say, but at the end of the day, I want to tell you that that is going to save us tens of thousands of dollars as we try to finish this building. We're going to pray in one minute. And when we pray, we're going to bless Larry DeLuca today. We're going to bless his wife. We're going to bless his family. We're going to bless his business. Your generosity brings a proportionate response from heaven. And finally, here's the best part. Your generosity brings a disproportionate response from heaven. Paul's little letter to the Philippians closes with another one of the best loved promises in the word of God. And my God shall supply all your needs. Beloved, I want you to know that this is a promise only for the generous. If you're stingy with God, you are on your own. God responds in proportion to your generosity. But listen, when he responds, his response is disproportionate. If you're new to harvest time, I'm going to teach you something and we're done. And my God shall supply all your needs. But look at how he supplies them. And my God shall supply all your needs. Kata two. That's Greek. It means in proportion to. And my God shall supply all your needs in proportion to what? In proportion to your needs? No. And my God shall supply all your needs. Kata to. In proportion to his riches in glory. In other words, for the generous, God will supply your needs not in proportion to your needs, but he'll supply your needs in proportion to his glorious ability to provide. Listen to what that looks like and we're done. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously shall reap generously and God is able to make all grace abound to you 
so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to the eater will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. That means he'll give you enough to give and enough to live. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God responds in proportion to our generosity, but when he responds, his response is disproportionately good. Partnership in giving, five truths. Your giving is partnership in the gospel. It's a way to know Christ and the fellowship of his suffering. It's a heavenly investment. It's fragrant worship that pleases God and it brings a proportionate, disproportionate response from heaven. Would you stand on your feet this morning and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a good praise today?